and we're in subaquatic mood now too as we go down under down under chain of coral reefs and islands guarding a continent's coastline, the barrier reef stretches for 2,000 kilometres down the east coast of Australia. At the southern end lies Heron Island, and just offshore, a column of coral known as the Big Bommy. is based on an Aboriginal word adopted by sailors and skin divers to describe isolated coral heads that stick up from the bed of the ocean. This is the story of a cluster of bommies and the fish and other marine creatures that live there. This coral head is called the mushroom top. It has a large overhang which is home to a number of predatory fish such as coral trout. This is a surgeon fish. Owing to the lack of sunlight, the coral sometimes opens its flower-like polyps to feed in daytime. The bommies have their own underwater gardens. These are gorgonians, or sea fans. Like the feather star, they're animals rather than plants. Feather stars are related to sea urchins and starfish. This hydroid, often called fireweed, has a particularly potent sting. The finger-like polyps belong to the so-called daylight coral, one of the few to feed in full sunlight. Between the big bommy and mushroom top, there are several smaller heads of coral. Beyond, there's a large area of dead stag's horn coral, its antler-like branches broken by past storms. Shoals of damselfish of various species feed there. Sometimes the bommy dwellers have visitors from another world. Some of them became accustomed to visits from the crew of this particular launch. The vessel belonged to the Australian camera and diving team Ben and Eva Crop. The Crops spent years diving on the big bommy reef, taking photographs and recording data for research purposes and conservation work. deck, an assistant plays a vital role attending the compressor and the airlines. The batfish of the big bommy are large, inquisitive and unafraid of people. trumpet fish lives near the bommie. It 
doesn't move far from its territory, but when it goes in search of prey, it sometimes lies close to other species like big Maori cod. It uses them as a stalking horse, creeping along behind the better camouflaged fish. Occasionally it stops off at a patch of green weed, locally called turtle grass, in which it grooms itself, perhaps to brush off parasites. Trumpet fish exhibit different colours. Both of these fish belong to the same species, although they have different markings. The two swim together in what's probably a courtship ritual. Virtually every coral head has a resident moray eel. Morays have a particularly bad reputation, which isn't justified. They open their mouths because they need a continuous flow of water through their mouths to breathe. If unprovoked, Moray eels are docile creatures. Perhaps the most intriguing inhabitants of the Bommy are the small cleaner fish. They're a species of wrasse. These fish establish stations all over the Bommie and perform a special dance. Bommie's strangest fish is a remarkable creature called a wobbegong, or carpet shark. Though they can grow to just under three meters long, wobbegongs are usually harmless to man. They lie on the bottom, superbly camouflaged by the tassel-like growths around the mouth that resemble seaweed, and the dappled spots that perfectly match groups of coral polyps. Concealed in this way, they ambush small fish, crabs, lobsters, and octopus. Just a little distance from Mushroom Top, the Stag's Horn coral area supports a wide variety of smaller residents. The brightly coloured butterfly fishes have long snouts which are adapted for picking food out of coral crevices. coral trout change colour to attract mates and during territorial displays. This one changes back to plain grey as soon as it starts to move. This octopus is so well camouflaged that only a trained eye can spot it. When disturbed, it releases ink to act like a smoke screen while it makes its escape. The tusk fish has enormously strong teeth for crushing crabs and mollusks. This one moves large lumps of coral and shifts quantities of sand with its pectoral fins in its search for food. The stonefish is one of the most dangerous creatures living on the Bommie. Its dorsal spines can inject a powerful venom that can kill. It matches its background perfectly. The stonefish can be dangerous to an unwitting diver. 
When the stonefish feels threatened, it puffs up to make itself look larger and more intimidating. Another poisonous fish which is related to the stonefish is the fireworks fish or butterfly cod. Its fins may resemble delicate feathers, but they inject a poison which causes excruciating pain. The banded shrimp goby is another member of the community living around Big Bonnie. This little fish associates with several species of shrimp. The goby benefits from the relationship as the shrimps excavate their shared burrow. The shrimps use the fish as a lookout and a bodyguard and may get supplementary food by cleaning parasites from the goby. Giant manta rays cruise past the bummy. Mantas are sometimes called devil rays, but in fact they're completely harmless. Like many of the largest marine creatures, including most whales, they live by sifting plankton from the water. To the turtles, the bommy is probably a sea mark that guides them to the beaches where they lay their eggs. They mate in these waters too. Life in and around the bommy changes with the seasons and even with the time of day. The crop's next dive will be at night. Most coral polyps, the tiny animals that build a hard shell of the reef around themselves, are nocturnal feeders. They extend their tentacles to catch food from the surrounding water. The predominant colours of the floodlit bommy are glowing reds and oranges, like this starfish spread on a patch of dead coral. During this dive, the crops came across a parrotfish resting upside down on a coral shelf. The yellow trumpet fish isn't normally active at night, but this one has been disturbed by the diver's lights. Many of the creatures encountered during a daytime dive can also be seen during the night. This is a wobbegong. A resting green turtle is disturbed and heads for the surface to take a breath. The reptile's trusting nature very nearly led to its demise. These gentle creatures had no defence against hunters who captured them for their eggs, meat and shells.
In late summer, the sky banks up with clouds and the cyclone season is on its way. The sea around the Bommy clouds up too, as storms along the coast make themselves felt in the shallow waters of the reef. The Bommy's inhabitants, like these sweet lips, become used to living temporarily in a kind of submarine twilight. At this time of year, the Bommy becomes shrouded in a fog of disturbed sand and coral debris. Sometimes, when the Bommy lies directly in a cyclone's path, the force of the storm demolishes parts of the column. This white scar shows where wave action has broken off a large portion of the coral. Many people imagine that a reef is honeycombed. This smashed section shows that the underlying structure created by generations of polyps is, in fact, solid limestone. Cyclones are not the coral's only enemies. This creature, inching its way across the sand, is known as the crown of thorns. It's a starfish that feeds on coral polyps. Every 15 years or so, it reaches plague proportions, and there's been worldwide fear that it might largely destroy the coral reefs that protect many tropical coastlines. The white patch below the crown of thorns shows where the starfish has already fed, killing the living coral. The outbreaks may be natural events, but there's also some controversy about how overfishing and increased fertilizer runoff affect the starfish populations. Fortunately, the coral has managed to regenerate between the starfish explosions, but this apparently cyclical event is still causing concern. May brings the end of the cyclone season and a time of plenty to the reef. The seabirds are quick to spot shoals of young pilchards, which are driven to the surface by larger predatory fish species. Jacks are hunters which follow the pilchard shoals in from the open ocean. The resident hunters, like the Maori cod, also benefit from this temporary abundance. When the shoals drift in over the reef, there's plenty for all. By grouping together in great glittering shoals, the tiny fish hope to confuse their enemies and gain safety in numbers. Those fish on the edges of the shoal are more likely to get eaten, so the fish constantly try to move to the middle. This grouper lies in ambush behind some turtle grass. It's after a small shoal of fish called fusiliers. Most sick or wounded fish swim in a slightly strange way. The predators soon detect abnormal vibrations and are quick to attack. A white-tipped reef shark, perhaps attracted by the victim's blood, arrives to scavenge a corpse abandoned by one of the hunters. Not all the fish visiting the Bommie are after food. Many come here to visit the grooming stations. Each coral outcrop in the Bommie has its own resident cleaner wrasse. 
the little fish's dancing displays attract customers. All of these cleaners start life as females. The largest female in each group turns into a male and dominates the others. If he dies, the next largest female changes sex and becomes the leader. The wrasse and their hosts have a symbiotic relationship where both benefit from the encounter. The wrasse obtains food in the form of dead scales and parasites from the larger fish's body. The host fish rids itself of unwanted sources of irritation and potential infection which it couldn't remove itself. There are other advantages for the wrasse. The fish it cleans are often predatory and quite capable of eating the wrasse. But when species like the trumpet fish come for a clean-up, they're not hunting and the cleaners benefit from their temporary protection. A batfish keels over almost as if it's in a trance as the wrasse go to work. The cleaners even turn the voracious moray eel. The arrangement works well until another species, the false cleaner, arrives. This imposter has narrower and brighter stripes than the real thing. It isn't a wrasse at all, but a saber-toothed blenny belonging to a quite different fish family. The false cleaner mimics the behavior of true cleaners and then takes a sharp bite out of its would-be host. The trumpet fish swims away while the tusk fish writhes in discomfort. Despite occasional deceptions by false cleaners, the true cleaner continues to enjoy immunity from being eaten by its symbiotic partner, even when the partner is a predatory coral trout. The coral trout isn't really a trout at all, but it looks a bit like one. It feeds on small fish, and is quite capable of swallowing wrasse. But instead of eating them, the coral trout encourages them to groom it, even round its cavernous mouth and inside its gills. Bommie's reputation as a cleaner station brings in some giant host species. Manta rays call in regularly to have their enormous undersurfaces freed from parasites. Cleaner fish from all around swim out to attend the ray. fish attached to the underside of this manta are remora or sucker fish. They hitch rides by sticking themselves to their hosts. There are thousands of coral outcrops along the Great Barrier Reef. Each has its own regular visitors and resident community. It's a strange world which is still being explored. Every year, divers are making fresh finds and discovering new relationships between the fascinating and varied creatures which live on the Big Bommie. Sunday, tune in, turn on, get wild on five with a zoo of animal telly. 
We begin at five with the last show on earth, narrated by Kenneth Branagh, with music by Sting, Kate Bush, and Elton John. This powerful film looks at man's relationship with the natural world. Man on a mission, Nick's quest at seven. It's been around for almost two million years. It's been hunted, its habitat destroyed. The Cuban crocodile could soon face extinction in the wild. I was determined to see one before it was too wow. late. Wolf hybrids. Are any of these animals safe around the home? What's the story at 7.30?